We've got Dr. Martins here for um, update on the new triage. Good evening, everybody. So um, uh, we are going to go over some of the uh, trauma triage update points, and this is not breaking news, uh, but it's slowly making its way across the state. This is uh, the update that was written uh, by the National, um, basically, uh, American College of uh, Trauma Surgery, American College of Students Committee on Trauma, in conjunction with about 15 uh, additional uh, uh, professional groups. So, uh, EMS, emergency medicine, orthopedic surgeons, anesthesiology, everyone who has uh, kind of an input on trauma. Um, we did some of the guidelines, and I'll show you why they changed a few things. They made some things uh, more simple, uh, moved the priority around a little bit, made the look of it a little bit different, and uh, we'll go through some of the steps. Now, for those of you who've been doing, you know, especially for trauma alerts or helicopter requests, we've been doing this for a while, not a whole lot changes. Um, this makes it a little bit more logical. I do have the, the handout in front of you, and you can see that the style of it is different, and well, we'll explain that. And then once we go through some of the categories um, of the trauma triggers, the triage changes, the uh, lead behind that, we'll run through about four cases at the end that, that apply that. I have them all set in dollars, because that is the last place that I did this training. So we all get to pretend that we're in dollars, when we, when we do cases, but that's okay. You can translate this to you know, wherever you uh, find yourself. Okay. So, let's get going here. All right. These slides are all available on the website for the American College Service. Committee on Trauma, this is EMS Education. They did a very nice job of putting together educational slides for this, and this is Focus. Uh, there are, uh, there's two different slide decks that are focused at pre hospital care, so uh, they took everyone into consideration for this. So, this is nothing that I created, this is all on them. I just changed a couple of the facts to fit more of our area. What's the um, It's basically that. National Trauma, trauma Field Triage Guidelines, American College of Surgeons. All right, so some of the things that we're going to be looking at is just a, a the update process, explain some of the changes, um, and then um, apply it locally. And of course, they have following your own rules, so this. This is uh, based on your own local resources, and you have to make certain decisions uh, based on that. So we recognize that everybody's setup is a little bit different. Okay. All right. So the first thing that they um, uh, noted is that this, like I said, this is a, a guideline that has to fall into your um, own area. This is an update based on about uh, 30 years total of work, and the last update that they wrote was in 2011, I believe, so it's been over a decade of having statistics based on their previous triage. Um, so they, they adopted a little bit uh, different things, but their, their goal is still the same, and that's to get the right patient to the right place at the right time. So trying to get your patient to the the most appropriate facility, and uh, we'll go into the difference between what happens if you don't triage correctly, either over triage or under triage, and then uh, putting kind of the education behind this so that everyone operates uh, the same. Okay, so like I said, the last uh, guideline was published in 2011, so it's a while ago. I want to make this more consistent and reduce the um, over and under triage rate. So over triage means that um, you send somebody to a higher level of care and they don't need to be there. So as most of you are aware, that's quite expensive. The under triage rate means that you uh, maintain them in either a, a local or a lower level uh, trauma center when they actually need higher level of care. 
That is not the best outcome for the patient because then they either don't get care or uh, things get missed or it gets delayed because you have to do a secondary transport. So historically, we have accepted almost a 50% over to react rate. So sending quite a few more people uh, to higher level of care just so we don't miss trauma cases. So the to be less than 5%, and historically the rate was accepted to be 50%. They're trying to cut that down, okay, because that's very expensive, uh, especially if you're using high level resources. Does anyone have any idea how much it costs to get into a medical helicopter these days? 20,000. Four. <laughs> yeah, about, about somewhere between it depends. Around here, it's 30, 40, 45. <laughs> If you go either west or east of us, so uh, the western in the, in the mountains or along the east coast, those helicopters are notoriously more expensive, usually in the 60 grand range. And often not covered by insurance because they're, guess what? Out of network. Because nobody really has a helicopter in their network. Okay? So we try to, I mean, if, if somebody truly needs life-saving intervention, yes, we need to pull out all the stops. But um, that's why trying to get them the best resources, the most appropriate resources, but not costing, you know, literally an arm of life. So what they did, um, they actually did um, a bunch of research. They took the results and they asked EMS, oh no, what a concept. The people who actually have to use this. So they sent out a survey. Uh, it went to 29 large organizations. They got almost 4,000 back, and they actually took that into consideration. So they took those responses. They sent them up to a bunch of, like I said, trauma surgeons, uh, EMS medical directors, field providers, um, trauma registrars, coordinators, educators. Everybody went through this, and they pulled out some uh, interesting data that they thought would be able uh, to make this work better, especially in hospital areas. <laughs> so they also went through, like I said, research and literature and all the updates that we have uh, that has been generated in the past decade. And um, then they made a bunch of decisions. They tried to be as consistent as possible. So this is what the old um, triage guideline looked like. The Wisconsin version was a little bit different um, because we had two, two sections of step one. So the total Wisconsin triage was actually five steps. That's because um, they had a, a big concern about airway. Um, they spent 45 minutes at one meeting deciding whether or not EMS knew what an airway was. Okay. So, now that we know that you do know what an airway is, uh, we will just move forward with that. Okay. So, as opposed to kind of the pathway, the, step, the stepwise guideline, the new um, uh, guideline error is the handout that I gave you, and it is more of a checklist. It's more of something they, they try to design it so things would come up to you as you evaluate your scene uh, or your patients. And you can see that there's a red section at the top and a yellow section at the bottom. We'll go through that just by default for anyone who knows you know, how we do things. Red is probably worse, right? And then yellow is probably not as bad. So that's what it means. Emphasize it's not an algorithm you need to you can go through it as soon as you find something that either pulls a yellow or a red trigger, um, that means that you have an applicant patient and uh, they try to make it more user friendly. Okay? Um, <clears throat> based on their initial field test, this did get you to the decision to either call a trauma alert or a, a major trauma if you need additional resources sooner. So that was that was one of their. Hi. Um, like I said, red's on top, yellow's on the bottom. If you read top to bottom, right to left, it doesn't really matter. As soon as you figure out what is uh, what's important to your patient, then you can make a decision. All right. So some of the red categories. All right. So updates on injury patterns. So the new part is the recognition of tourniquet use. Okay? So emphasis on tourniquet use is you truly need a tourniquet, you also need a vascular surgeon. Okay? 
That being said, the words truly are in there. So we also recognize that everyone is carrying tourniquets these days. To me, tourniquet is the Narcan of trauma. Okay? Everyone gets one. You may or may not need one. So if you are triaging being applied, you have to make sure that your mechanism of injury and your wound actually correspond to that. Because we have many civilians that apply tourniquets, you have law enforcement that apply tourniquets, you have responders, um, you have people who are just there. So, uh, yes, someone who truly has a tourniquet need also needs a vascular surgeon, and that means that they have to go to a high road to care trauma. Okay? So that's one point. Then they reworded some of these just to be a little bit more clear. So penetrating injuries to head, neck, torso, and proximal extremities. They took away the caveat of uh, proximal to elbow and knee. Um, it's mostly just recognition that your, your main box, the center of your body, that's a high risk group. Okay? So penetrating trauma to the center of the body usually also requires a vascular surgeon, or at least a trauma surgeon. Okay. Then, under skull deformity, uh, suspected skull fracture, they took out the words open or depressed because they really they recognize that we cannot make that diagnosis in the field, and they they don't want you mushing on people to tell whether it's open or depressed. Okay, so we'll just give you the benefit of the doubt and say, yeah, that looks kind of bad. All right. Uh, suspected spinal injury with new motor or sensory loss. It took out the word paralysis because they wanted to emphasize uh, the significance of uh, a partial spinal cord injury. So even if you can still move somewhat, but you have weakness and you have either uh, numbness, tingling, you know, inability to control your extremity, that also is significant. So it's not like you have to be totally paralyzed before we get you to a higher level of care. You recognize a spinal cord injury and uh, that buys you at least a trauma alert usually transfer to higher level of care because they also need neurosurgery uh, to take care of that. Okay. Um, then chest wall instability, deformity, or suspected flail chest. They added suspected because, again, you don't have all of the capability of being able to totally uh, diagnose that. So if you have a high suspicion, then it, that needs to get worked up. <clears throat> okay, then the same thing, suspected pelvic fracture, suspected fracture of two or more proximal long bones. So again, recognizing that we don't have the ability to do definitive uh, diagnosis in the field. Everyone knows that proximal long bones are your femurs and your humerus, right? It is not your tip fib, it is not your wrist. Okay, so these don't count. Your two bones, you get to break those, those are not major trauma. Okay. Then uh, things that did not change is um, the, the leftover statements there. So uh, fresh, uh, degloved, mangled, pulseless. So again, vascular compromise, amputation proximal to wrist or ankle, and then um, yeah, the the tourniquet is the first point. Okay. So specific age-related assessment and vital signs um, were kind of subcategorized. So, one thing that they added uh, to uh, the child and adults, now notice these age ranges are a little bit different. For trauma, uh, young children are single digits old. Okay, so they're less than age 10. Then, once you hit 10 and above, um, you are considered uh, kind of in the older child to adult range. Okay, and then Sorry, once you hit 65, you're considered geriatric. Everyone, I know, get in line. Okay? And that has to do more with your metabolism, your physiology, co-medications, and comorbidities. So sorry, getting old kind of sucks. Okay, so what they did is they added this called the shock index. The shock index for adult patients is any time that your heart rate passes your systolic blood pressure. Okay, so think about that. You've been triaging people like this all the time. So if your heart, if your systolic blood pressure is you know 108 over 60, and your heart rate is 68, you're not that impressed. But if your blood pressure is 108 over 60 and your heart rate is 140, 
you're a little more impressed, okay? Because that usually means that you've had some, um, you know, relative compensatory tachycardia, and it also means your body's being stressed, okay? You have to take that into account of the fact that, you know, people have beta blockers have this blunted. So that's why uh, if you look up there, the systolic blood pressure cutoff for people who are over 65 is higher. So you need to be above 110 to say that you're not going into uh, uh, some sort of shock. Okay, so shock index is a very nice thing that you can apply to a lot of your patients. It's not just in trauma. If you, can, you can apply this also in sepsis. Okay, so anytime, anytime your vital signs start crossing each other, I get very suspicious. Okay, then uh, recognition of respiratory distress or respiratory um, support. So more emphasis on recognition of, of respiratory compromise. And anyone who's had toxic and a trauma patient um, probably needs a little more care. Okay. Then, um, the Glasgow Coma Scale, we, we simplify. So this has been studied and argued for almost a decade that we actually don't care about some of the numbers. The most important number is your motor score. Your motor score, your best motor score is a six, and that means that you are cooperative and following commands, okay? So for a long time, uh, I would teach people that if you tell your patients, stick out your finger, touch your nose, we don't need to end up at an unless they're missing the one. So, just based on their neuro exam. But, so, if they cannot follow commands, um, then they need uh, a neurologic evaluation. The flip side of that is obviously our most commonly over triaged patients are ones with altered mental status in which you suspect a head injury. And it turns out not to be a head injury, it turns out to be a chemical influence. Okay. So we are still uh, following that. We're trying to get better at that. But just recognize that altered mental status of trauma patients sometimes isn't trauma. Right. But this is one way to kind of sort that out a little better. So like I said, simple command, tell them to do something. If they can do that, that's why the score is six on the motor scale. And then if they're confused or not able to follow commands, they lose points. If they do just uh, reactions, like if you try to uh, split their wrist and they pull it away, but they don't do anything purposeful, now they lose another point. Okay, and then we go down into some posturing. So a uh, decortic posture, cerebral posturing, and then nothing. Okay, so even, you know, my mouse here, it's a score of one. <clears throat> okay. They added in the uh, lowest acceptable blood pressure range for uh, the children, single digits. So this is um, this is a formula that's commonly used in pediatric emergency medicine. So it's uh, whatever their age is, double it, add it to 70. That's supposed to be the lowest acceptable blood pressure that they have. Okay, now on to our yellow section. All right, so things that are on here. Um, the new emphasis that they added was any child, so single digit child, um, who is unrestrained or improperly restrained. So if they're in a car crash with significant mechanism and they are not in their car seat, or they're in their car seat but the car seat is not attached to anything, we call that an internal car bullet. Um, so recognizing that they need the extra protection of that car seat, and if that car seat is not functional, then they are much more likely to sustain uh, transfer of, of energy during that trauma. Okay, um, most of that is the same. So the intrusion um, uh, mechanisms are the same, but they added the emphasis on extrication from entrapped patients. The caveat to that is it's not it's not somebody who simply can't get out and they can't pop the door. You're actually in trouble. So parts of the car are either on you, in you, wrapped around you, something where it has to be moved away before you can actually get out. And that is, again, the recognition of the amount of energy that's transferred to the vehicle 
that then collapse in on you because now they're making the cars much more resistant to crashes. Okay. Um, they expanded the definition of this a little bit. It used to just be, you know, motorcyclists that was separated from their vehicle. Now it is expanded to other vehicles. So uh, if you're on a ATV, a UTP, a horse, a donkey, a bucking bronco, and you are forcefully separated, not just you forgot to set your saddle and you tipped over. Okay, so forcefully separated, that is considered a significant mechanism. Okay. Um, this is just. Oh, they changed on this. Oh, they removed the speed limit. Because it used to be um, pedestrian or bicyclist run over in a like 30 miles an hour. They don't care. So, um, I mean, yes, if you're on the sidewalk and grandma backs into you, that is not really a significant mechanism. But anyone who is struck on an open vehicle, so if you're walking or if you're riding um, like a bicycle or even you know a scooter or something that's open, you don't have the potential. Right? And then the fall from height, they changed. Um, it used to be greater than 20 feet in an adult and more than three times the height of a child. Uh, they found that anyone who falls over 10 feet uh, has a significant chance of injuring themselves. <clears throat> that being said, it is 10 feet from the lowest part of your body to whatever you land on. Okay, so ground level falls are how far? Zero. Zero. You're standing on the ground. Okay, doesn't matter that you fall. I have all sorts of uh, EMTs and paramedics who ask the person how tall they are, and then they write, that's how far they are. Okay, you're already on the ground. So ground level falls are zero, and that helps your, your trauma registrar at it correctly. You also have to register, uh, you have to realize that if you're up somewhere, but you're on a rope or a ladder or something, a scaffolding that protects you, and guides you halfway down, you didn't fall 20 feet. You only fell the last spot. Okay? So if you're free falling, that's something different. But if you get caught on a tree, something where you get stopped halfway down, it's that last section that we want to climb. Okay. <laughs> Got that. And then the things that were the same on here, um, uh, ejection, partial or complete from a, an automobile, death of a, a passenger in the same compartment. Okay, so not just in the same car, but in the same compartment. So that means that the person in that compartment experienced the same level of trauma. And then if um, the vehicle telemetry indicates a severe map. So if OnStar tells you that they spun around three times, you know, did a double flip and then landed in the ditch, then that's considered a significant map. Okay, so other points. We've got the 10 foot mark in general, but then recognizing that certain populations are prone to lower level um, or higher level of injury with lower level of falls. So anyone who's under five or over 65, um, even if they have low level falls, you need to evaluate them, especially if they land on their head. Okay, and this has been going on in Peter for decades. They've recognized that, you know, if the child falls off the changing table on their butt, it's not such a big deal. But if they land on their head, that could be a problem. Okay, so recognizing that mechanism. And then along with the children, any suspicion of child abuse needs to be evaluated thoroughly. Patients with special health care needs, both children and adults. Um, and this has to do with if their special health care needs, especially uh, impacts people with their airway, um, their ability to communicate, um, or if they are prone to bleeding. So I don't know how many uh, left ventricular assist device patients you have walking around, but they are they are prone to bleeding. So anytime they have a minor trauma or a minor bleed, even a nosebleed can make them unstable. So they need to get someplace that knows how to evaluate them. And that's what the special uh, care uh, needs mean. They have to go somewhere that somebody can actually figure it out. 
So if we've got a child who's on a vent, they need to go someplace that knows how to run a vent. They need to know how to troubleshoot that vent. As you've got your LVAD patient, they need to go to that, their LVAD and then they modified the anticoagulant use to be freestanding. It used to be anticoagulant use with a head injury. Now it's just if you're anticoagulated and you're a trauma patient, we recognize that you're at higher risk of having a bad outcome. Okay, so that is now a freestanding um, identifier. And then things on here that didn't change uh, pregnancy, burns, and that uh, children should preferentially go to a pediatric trauma center. That, that's not any change. Okay. So a few caveats with this. I said appreciate the context. This is for a single trauma scene. This is not an NCI triage. Okay. So this does not apply to 15 people out in you know, a bus crash. That's a different setup. So this is if you're individually triaging a trauma patient. It is pre-hospital only. This does not apply to hospitals. Okay. So hospitals get to have a little different variation on their rules. Um, they're much more driven by the pathophysiology of the patient, not so much the mechanism, because they've expected you to kind of screen for that. Okay. Appreciate your local resources, so knowing uh, which one of your uh, hospitals is which level of trauma center and what they can handle, especially your special needs patients. Um, it's not a good idea to take a pregnant trauma patient to somebody that doesn't do OB, because okay? they need monitoring. Same thing with burns, special health care needs. Okay. Um, this has been encouraged by, uh, you know, nationwide. The state of Wisconsin has adopted it. The um, various uh, herbs and RTAX have also uh, moved forward on this. We're doing the education, so yay us. And like I said, the uh, website that, that uh, released this does a very nice job about giving you um, some free educational uh, <laughs> material that you can use for training. And then tracking your outcomes. So it's a good idea to be able to get some feedback on your trauma patients. Again, this is nothing new. Uh, we like to know when things either go well or maybe don't go well, so that um, you can change your tactics in the future. You never know how your patients do. You always just assume you're doing the right thing. Guess what? Nobody always does the right thing. So if you keep making the same mistake again and again and again, because nobody's told you that you made a mistake, it doesn't really help you. Make sure you're asking for feedback and accept it when it gets set back. Right? So if they identify your challenges, use them. Use them as training every single time. Because I guarantee they're interesting cases. So share them. I've noticed though that not all the hospitals like to share. No, they don't. You have it helps if you get if you become a buddy with somebody, because then they know who you are and they know what kind of questions you're asking, and they know that you're not a lawyer. <laughs> Good point. Yeah. Okay. So again, working it into the system, um, these are our seven HERC regions. They, they mirror the trauma regions also, so this is being um, expanded and uh, adopted. So hopefully we're getting a little bit more consistent. Then recognizing um, your local and regional resources, so some of the trauma centers in the local area. Um, pay attention to who can get what and when, and what you know, what gets transferred, what gets kept. Then you kind of know the pattern of which way you're going to go, especially if it's time sensitive. Because, um, like I said, if we under triage and we just send them local, it takes probably two to three times as long to get them to the right place than if you just made that decision. It's much more complicated once we get them into a hospital. I think it would get easier. It does. <clears throat> okay. I always have this caveat use your local protocols. And then recognizing um, your intercepts and your assets. So just the play pattern we have for the data there. Okay. So summarizing the changes, um, the updates were very EMS heavy. They asked for input and they took um, our field work into consideration. So it was nice to see 
uh, the new guidelines tend to be easier to use and follow the flow of your assessment in the field. And the purpose is to further cut down on the uh, over and under training. Any questions on those points? You said I've got a couple cases to show you so that we can see how they apply to your triage decisions. Okay. All right, so cases, caveats, yes, scenarios, back to that. Okay, so here's our first case. So this is identified to be in a rural area. There's a level two trauma center approximately 30 to 40 minutes away. There's a level three trauma center, it's about 20 minutes away, and a community hospital also 20 minutes away. Um, air transport can get there in about 20 minutes. It's a little enthusiastic, but we'll just say 20 minutes to make it easy. Two vehicle crash, um, one car's over the embankment. Um, another car is flipped over in the ditch. So you and a second ambulance or a second responding unit, so there's two different units coming in. So first one is going to be this patient, and then we'll look at the second patient. So what you see here is the car, it's a sedan, it's over the embankment, it does have some front and side damage. The driver is a young female who is alert and responding, but is unable to get out because of the door damage that is seen there. The door is opened by a uh, rescue and she is able to self extricate. Okay, so any red flags yet? Okay. On primary survey, she's alert, she's talking, she's yelling for help, she answers questions appropriately, she does not appear to have any respiratory distress. Um, skin is warm, dry, and pink, she has a strong radio pulse, she is following commands, and she's a little peeved. Okay, so any red flags yet? Yeah. Okay. So your secondary trauma survey, she's covered in some small cuts because the windshield uh, broke onto her and she has bilateral uh, leg bruising where she kind of got shoved forward. Vitals are blood pressure 112 over 68, heart rate's 96, respiratory rate is 18, stats are 99%. And her glass pedophone scale motor score is six. She's able to follow commands very easily. She's got no meds, no history, has nothing significant to report. So, what category is she? Does she have any red flags? Does she have any yellow flags? Not really. Okay, so she is a boring trauma patient. Which is just fine. Boring is good. Too much less paperwork. Right. So she has no increased risk identified so far. Doesn't mean she doesn't have any injuries. She can very easily have bounced her spleen around. But right now she's stable. So she doesn't deserve an evaluation, but we have not identified that she requires higher level of care. Right? So she is she can be a local transport. <clears throat> All right, let's go find the other person. So um, the other car went over the embankment and rolled onto the side. It is jammed into a tree. Um, also, there is a um, young female restrained driver who's awake and answering questions, um, but she notes that her um, lower extremities are trapped on the dash. This requires more complex maneuvers to uh, remove the roof, roll the dash, and extrication takes about 25 minutes. Okay, so any red flags? Yes. Okay, red or yellow? Yellow. Yeah. Okay. Because she's still talking. Yeah. So that part's good. All right. Said so alert talking, no respiratory distress, skin warm, dry, pink, radio pulse is strong, she's following command. She's also rather upset about this whole situation. And on exam, she has exactly the same injuries. So she's got some eyes of the same um, for level of consciousness. She's also young and healthy, so um, no meds, no allergies, no past medical history. So the difference between those two is that extra patient. Okay? So she is a yellow patient. She would be a trauma alert, but she still may not need to go to the uh, level one or two trauma centers. 
right? So the hospital needs this one was more significant than the other one, especially if they're both getting these two patients. But so far, she's awake and stable. Did that change? Yes. Okay. Questions on those two? <clears throat> Here's a very common call that we go to on a regular basis. You're called to a local residence for an elderly male with a problem to fall. He uh, is found laying on the couch near, uh, sorry, lying on the ground near the couch, He's unable to get up by himself. And he lives alone, so he activated either by his fall alert button or he called on his cell phone or however he managed to call for help. But he's down and uh, he can't get back up. Okay, so let's see how he's doing. He's alert. He answers questions. He does not appear to be in any respiratory distress. Uh, skin is warm, dry, and pink. He has a strong radial pulse. He's following commands, and he's uh, alert-oriented. He says he just tripped and down. He went to get himself back up. Any red flags so far? Any yellow flags so far? So far, so good. On exam, he has a large hematoma or a fusig. On his left forehead with a small skin tear. And you know that he has multiple bruises on his arms and they are different colors. Okay, so he's got some old bruising. And then his vitals include blood pressure 168 over 84, heart rate of 84, respiratory rate 12, sets are 96% on wound air. He is able to follow commands, so his Glasgow public scale will score is 6. He's got history of coronary artery. Disease, hypertension, osteoarthritis, AFib, and he is on warfarin. Okay, so what in your secondary survey may put him at increased risk? Okay. Yep, all right. So he's anticoagulated, but specifically he's anticoagulated and he bonked himself in the head. Okay. So, so far his neurostatus is good. He does require an evaluation. He will be a trauma alert at a local hospital because he would likely go to get skin sooner rather than later. And then they would uh, do a very thorough head to toe on him. As he's old, he fell, he's anticoagulated, he would get himself back up. Okay. I don't know how many times a week you see this gentleman, but we meet him quite frequently. So this is a good consideration to have. Questions on that one? All right. Final example. <clears throat> you get called for a man who fell off a ladder. Okay. Um, upon arrival, you see an adult male who's laying on a concrete driveway. So he didn't land so well. And there's a tall ladder next to him. And he's standing in front of a two-story house. Or he's laying. He was in front of a two-story house. He's awake and can answer questions. So good. <laughs> um, he does not appear to have any respiratory distress. His skin is warm, dry, and pink. He does have a strong radio pulse. He's able to follow the bands, and he says that he was working up on the eaves and the ladder gave out. So he did fall from close to the roof. He has a goose egg on the back of his head. So he smacked the back of his head either on the way down or on, on the concrete. And he says he can't move his legs. And he says they feel cold and numb. He has full strength in his arms and can follow commands. Okay? He has no obvious uh, uh, deformities either in his arms or his legs. And his vitals include a blood pressure of 152 over 110, a heart rate of 70, respiratory rate of 22, sets are 98% on room air. His Glasgow motor scale, a Glasgow cone scale over section is considered a six. Why is it a six if you can't move his legs? Yeah, so you get the best score possible for your motor scale. So whatever you can do the best, so if you only have a finger that moves, but you can move it on command and with purpose, you get a six. 
okay? You know, give them the, the best benefits, and then you also have to then know the deficits. Okay, so that's kind of the balancing act between your neuro exam. Okay, he's known to have a history of hypertension, coronary or artery disease, and he's had a double bypass. All right, so does he have red flags? Okay, does he have yellow flags? Oh, yeah. Yeah, yeah, we don't care. He's got red, but we'll give him extra credit for the yellows also. So you're correct. His mechanism automatically would him as a trauma triage, but then his subsequent deficits moved him into the red category. So this is someone who's going to be in higher level of care. He needs a level one or a level two trauma center sooner rather than later, and he might need to get into the very expensive air tax. Okay, any questions on that one? So it's fine if he's put him in red for sure, but could that be safe to get in? Um, yes, but uh, it does not indicate that it's like it's a deformity. It's just a hematoma. So he has, a, so he has a head injury, uh, but his neural status is still good. Okay, so that's a yellow. Okay. All right, so this is the update. Um, again, uh, considering your local availability, your resources, your usual transport patterns, these are some things that may influence that and either cause you to send somebody further away or you resources. Um, it also can help appropriately keep patients in their local community because uh, depending on what's available, they can be evaluated. This is not a guarantee that the local hospitals will not find something else and that's okay. Um, but we're trying to, again, hone down that over triage and that under triage to make the trauma system work as well for you and your community as possible. And uh, then we will continue to uh, train on this to get feedback on it, and they will um, develop this further as we get more data. Okay. Questions, comment, criticisms? All right. That's all I got for you.